the Catskill in the Catskill Mountains and um, nice little town um, and it seems to me like there's a lot of people that have this as a destination to come to just to see Dr. Scott Rosa and today we're here with uh, Dr. Rosa He's going to be talking to us um, about his observations that he's been seeing um, in anomalies in the cranial cervical um, junction. Um, so do you want to go ahead and start out and maybe just give a little bit of background about you and then uh, let's start out talking about the background study that you did that lent into what your new uh, work is now. Sure. Um, I've been a practicing chiropractic physician here in Rock Hill for about 28 years, um, probably about 15 years into my career. I started going for postgraduate training in advanced things like whiplash, brain traumatology, biomechanics. I just tried to enhance my knowledge base as we started to treat a lot of patients involved in head and neck trauma. Somewhere back in 2005, um, by accident, I had been scanning um, five, uh, excuse me, seven whiplash cases at an upright MRI facility south of here and came home that evening and found that five out of the seven had cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, which was something that I knew a little bit about but not enough to really understand how that might play into problems that we would start to uh, research or observe later on. So the cases that we observed in 2005 led to a paper published in 2010 uh, in Brain Injury Journal, and it was a fairly large cohort study. It was about 1,200 patients. And what we found that we found that people involved in head and neck trauma had uh, much more likelihood of having low-lying cerebellar tonsils as compared to the non-trauma cohort. Uh, actually, two and a half times more sensitive to find low-lying tonsils in head and neck trauma than those without trauma. So that posed some very interesting uh, desires to go ahead and see what, if anything, were the low-lying tonsils doing in terms of poor health or poor brain health. And then subsequently, as I continued to treat patients, I started to say, I wonder what would happen as a result of the low-lying tonsils to spinal fluid. So one day, uh, and let me just say thank you to Dr. Dominion and Fonar, as they were the uh, folks that helped me uh, elucidate things that I could never believe or dream of, i.e. we were able to go ahead and start to get hold of technology that was able to help us figure out what might be um, causing or contributing to the problems that we started to see revealing in the patients. So point being is uh, one evening I was up at the scanner that we work out of up in Albany, New York, and one of their top engineers um, I said to the engineer, I said, wouldn't it be interesting to see what happens with the low-lying tonsils to spinal fluid? And the engineer told me that Fonar had started to make a spinal fluid flow software um, to be able to assess that and then uh, that I should give a call and try to find out if we can get access to it. And thankfully, due to the graciousness of Fonar and Dr. Dumadian, they had agreed to let us start to work with the spinal fluid flow software. And of course, it didn't come without its problems. It took us about a year and a half to get the bugs out. But that software has really opened up a world of uh, information and observations that we were not able to assess prior to the technology coming about to do that. So with that said, we then went ahead after the study done in 2010. Uh, we had done a study up in Albany, and I don't think I'd ever do that again. We did 43 cases in four days, and uh, I normally do three to four cases in a day, and that's exhausting. But we did 43 cases in a day, and I had many colleagues there to help out. We probably had about five other physicians. And what we did is we did a study of 43 patients that were involved or had head and neck trauma. Uh, in this case, it was mostly whiplash. And were suffering from chronic recurring pain. And we wanted to go ahead and see if we can find any commonalities or threads that might connect the answers to why were they continuing to have chronic pain and what made them similar or dissimilar. So we did the 43 cases, and um, as I say, it took four days, and it was an on-taking, I don't think I'd ever do again, but ultimately at the end of that, what we found was some very compelling findings. Uh, one of them was um, we found a derangement of COC1, C1, C2 in all of the cases, and obviously a misalignment at the cranial cervical junction. We also found low-lying tonsils in most all of them, 
We also found spinal fluid obstruction in all of them. And uh, what we found was is that we took a, a cohort of them and we would scan them, we treated them, and then we did a post-spinal fluid flow study and found that those that got treated had improved flow. What we did though is we took about a third of them and we did a sham treatment and then we rescanned them and found virtually little change. And then we did a crossover study, meaning we did a random control crossover, whereby we took the crossover cohort and then we brought them back in and we actually treated them, then rescanned them again and found that all the sham group once treated had an improvement in spinal fluid flow. The purpose being is to be able to show um, the only thing that brought about a change to our observation was the C1 correction at the cranial cervical junction. So we had completed the 43 case study and came away with some very interesting observations. As I mentioned a moment ago, all the patients had misalignment at the cranial cervical junction of CO, C1, C1, C2. They all were found to have low-lying cerebellar tonsils. They all were found to have spinal fluid obstruction due to the low-lying tonsils. And um, the interesting part, though, was that when we sat back after and reviewed all the different cases, what we found was that out of the 40-plus cohort, there were several patients that had neurodegenerative brain disease. And I found that to be compelling because they all had history of head and neck trauma, they all had complaints of chronic recurring pain, various different types of symptoms, but they all looked similar in imaging, and the only difference was some of them manifested with neurodegenerative brain disease and some of them didn't. So that prompted me to question, is there some correlation behind the findings that we're seeing with the imaging, mm -hmm. the cranial cervical junction findings as well as the aberrant spinal fluid flow, could there be some connection between that and neurodegenerative brain diseases? And that sent me off into a further direction of looking into neurodegenerative brain disease cases separately, i.e. we then after that study went on and did studies of MS and Parkinson's and dementia cases to try to see if we can find any of these common threads that started to show up in our original case study. Okay. Um, Dr. Rosa, thank you for that um, little bit of background about um, where you are, how you got here today. Um, so now let's go ahead and start talking a little bit, um, have a little discussion here about the technique. Mm -hmm. um, Atlas Orthogonal is um, a specialty chiropractic technique, mm -hmm. and um, but you use um, a little bit different uh, imaging than um, the, shall I say, the, the regular, the, the Atlas Orthogonal uh, doctors. Mm -hmm. So do you want to go ahead and explain that? and the reason why. Sure. The Alice Orthogonal Procedure was developed by Dr. Roy Sweat, <coughs> my dear, very dear friend and mentor. And I've been practicing the Alice Orthogonal Procedure since about 1989 or 90. And uh, I've had a very successful practice in treating patients with that procedure. And there are other procedures that do Atlas types of correcting. Um, as I progressed on and started doing imaging, and of course, <clears throat> let me preface by saying I did develop and patent an imaging method designed for imaging people involved with head and neck trauma. And I, that was born out of the need from standard imaging I felt was falling short back in the mid-2000, early 2000 time frame <clears throat> of showing injuries to structures that we would see in cadaver studies but wouldn't necessarily be able to visualize in, in live humans. So that's when I got introduced to Dr. Demadian and the wonderful people at Phonar, where I was invited down to discuss with them uh, what might they be able to do to help us get more advanced imaging methods. And so we, we proceeded to get together and work very diligently with that. So fast forward, as I mentioned, <coughs> the Atlas procedure, the Atlas Orthogonal procedure is an excellent procedure, and there are many Atlas Orthogonal doctors mm -hmm. out there that do a great job. Um, as I started doing more and more imaging studies of people involved in head and neck trauma or what I call complex cases, I started to recognize on the imaging studies some findings that were not showing up on x-ray. Not because x-ray wasn't good, it's just that MRI gives the opportunity to do multiple thin slicing at areas at the cranial cervical junction that actually helped me be able to see things a little bit more clearly. Um, one of the things we made note of, over 20% of the patients that we've done with the MRI have been found to have malformations in the C2 vertebra. 
And of course, <clears throat> when you do an orthogonal-based uh, atlas correction, you do use an x-ray and you do uh, make measurements to derive something called an adjusting vector. Well, part of the creation of the vector has to do with the uh, C2 vertebra and its position relative to the rest of the cervical spine. And what I found was is that if the C2 vertebra was malformed, that would throw off the pattern of misalignment, which would then go ahead and throw off the correction. Might not get the correction as good as we, excuse me, as good as we would like. And I thought that was very interesting because I think people just assume that that the C2 vertebrae is is normal. That the, <coughs> nothing's wrong with it. Apparently not. <coughs> Apparently not. In yeah. fact, I was told there's a. There's a researcher at Parma College of Chiropractic that I believe did a study and found that there was an excess of over 20% of C2 vertebra that was malformed. Uh, I don't recall his name or if he published on that, but that was discussed amongst my colleagues. So with that said, um, what the MRI did was it opened up another dimension of seeing things at the craniocervical junction that we couldn't necessarily see with plain film x-ray. So it doesn't make me better than anyone that does regular atlas orthogonal mm -hmm. work or any other atlas doctor. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I pr pr you know, proceed to claim that I'm better. Sure. But the uh, IGAD, the image guided atlas treatment, was born out of the fact that because there were cases that were complex and wouldn't respond, respond to traditional atlas correcting, we found that the MRI opened up this uh, window of information that was able to help us modify uh, the vectors, be able to modify placement if necessary, and just help us to try to continue to make a great correction and try to reduce the problem. So the image guided atlas treatment is something that I created many years ago. It is a patent pending procedure. And it is whereby we do a, we take the patient, we do a pre-MRI scanning, <coughs> which is fairly extensive. It's about a two hour scan. Mm -hmm. And that scan includes multiple sequences to look at the cranial cervical junction in many different planes and methods. And then we also do a spinal fluid flow study and arterial venous flow study. So that is done before we go ahead and actually make the correction or give the patient the treatment. Once the MRI is completed, then I'll take the MRI, I'll review it, I'll capture images from the MRI, and then I will use the MRI images to further derive the vectors to make the correction to the C1 misalignment, which is what kind of sets the IGAD apart from traditional basic atlas correcting, which again is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But we have found on these complex cases that the MRI guidance tends to help us quite a bit. And respectfully, the studies that we've done since about 2000, <clears throat> oh, I'd say about 2007 on, have included this method and we're very pleased to state that the pre and post studies are demonstrating that gaining the vectors through the guidance of the MRI and the spinal fluid flow uh, tends to give us very good results. So, Okay, so now you used uh, the Phonar upright MRI. Correct. Um, is there any, I mean, would you feel like you could get the same results in, um, in the recumbent MRI or do you use the upright for a specific reason? Actually, that was the paper that we published in 2010. We did a cohort of 1,200 patients, 600 with a history of trauma, 600 with a history of non-trauma. And out of those cohorts, 300 were done with a recumbent MRI and 300 were done in the upright MRI. And again, the upright MRI was found to be two and a half times more sensitive to picking up the patho-anatomical findings as compared to the recumbent MRI. So our observations are is that when you're dealing with a gravity environment, Certainly when it comes to the spine, mm -hmm. we find that the gravity environment in the upright MRI tends to show more pathology, as it did we found in that paper. And after years of observing and scanning and treating many patients with complex cases that oftentimes present to me for uh, consideration for acceptance for, for treatment, when we review the recumbent MRIs, we find that they usually fall short in showing things that the upright MRI might be able to do to uh, many things, not just gravity, mm -hmm. uh, the spine goes into a different position or posture under gravity than it does when you're laying down, not to get too scientific, but sure. there, there is a, a definite improvement or benefit from the upright MRI technology and positioning of scanning than there is to recover, in my opinion. Okay. All right, so let's uh, start uh, talking a little bit about the pathology that mm -hmm. you've um, that you've observed. You mentioned about the malformed C2. Mm -hmm. Um, 
How about, uh, you talked a little bit about um, the obstruction of CSF by low-lying tonsils. Um, can you give us, um, I know one of the first meetings I had with you, you talked about it being the cork in the mouth of the bottles. Yes. So do you want to explain a little bit about that? I think that that kind of gives us, uh, would give us a picture detail of, uh, if you explain that. Yes. Um, many years ago, uh, a dear friend and colleague of mine uh, had invited me to meet with um, the, the head of the anatomy department at Albert Einstein Medical Center. And we went down to do a dissection. And when I was introduced to the doctor that ran that, that program, uh, I had explained to him the observations of these low-lying tonsils and trauma. And I showed him all the imaging that we had. And his term, after reviewing the imaging, he said, this is very compelling. And he said um, that he would call this kind of the cork in the mouth of the bottle syndrome. Essentially, when the bottom back part of the brain, the cerebellar tonsils, settle into the opening in the skull, it can constitute not only a blockage, but it can constitute an obstruction that can start to cause a backing up of the spinal fluid. And what we have learned, not only by our observations, but by others in the, in the scientific community, that apparently spinal fluid moving in and out of the head is an essential component for good brain health. Uh, recently, in the past, I think about a year and a half, two years, there's been discussion of something called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've always known that we have lymph nodes in the neck, the armpits, and the groin that are designed to go ahead and filter out toxins. Uh, the researchers didn't know there was something like that existed in the brain, but as of about a year and a half to two years ago, the researchers have found that the brain does in fact have its own lymphatic system called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. And that glymphatic system functions through the spinal fluid. So this became a very important um, part of our puzzle because we know that as spinal fluid moves, as we see post-treatment, that patients report feeling better. And if it's not moving, there's a myriad of different types of clinical symptoms that can manifest that we've seen in these cases. And therefore, our goals are to, A, do everything we can to get the spinal fluid to move as, as its purpose to bring about good brain health and B, to observe the possible sequela of what happens when it doesn't move properly, of which we've done thousands and thousands of MRIs and have found uh, many poor sequela and outcomes from the obstruction of that fluid. And haven't you also found that uh, do where the, how the CSF is obstructed, that you, ha you are kind of hypothesizing that that is, uh, could mean what kind of disease or neurological um, trauma, whatever you want to call it, um, that the patient could end up with. It might be Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Do you want to talk a little bit? I know that you've scanned a few Parkinson's patients and Alzheimer's and even the traumatic brain injury. You've got um, working with some NFL um, players, yes. pro sports, so can you review a little bit about some of those findings? Yeah, um, and again, these are observations we've been making, my colleagues and I, over many years now, and these are merely observations. We continue to say, my very dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Michael Freeman and Dr. David Harshfield, uh, they're really my closest um, allies in, mm -hmm. these, in these interesting observations we've made with the advanced imaging studies. and. Um, these observations pose many questions. We say we have more questions than answers. We just have really great questions to ask because the imaging is done in real time so we can actually see spinal fluid moving in real time and see how it can adversely affect the brain. And we've got these movies that show it. So I think what we're observing is the following. It's a hypothesis at this time, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I use the analogy that cancer is cancer. It's just that cancer can manifest in different places in the body. And we're of the thought that some of these observations pose the question that maybe neurodegenerative brain diseases are more similar than dissimilar. It's just a matter of how they manifest. And we have some observations of imaging of MS cases. We have Parkinson's. We have ALS. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Alzheimer's. We have dementia. Um, and if I put these imaging studies up next to each other, there are more commonalities than dissimilarities. So we are of the opinion that maybe somewhere down the line when we get more of these questions and answers and we have to go to people a whole lot smarter than I am 
in areas that I'm not trained in, like anatomists and physiologists, mm -hmm. to show them what we've observed to see if we pose our hypothesis of what we think is happening. If they agree that it's plausible, then we have to look to them to help explain how and what is going on to do that. So, um, as you know, everyone in the field of medicine and science is trying to do everything possible to come up with answers for things or the genesis of neurodegenerative brain diseases. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have some wonderful pieces of the puzzle at this time that might hopefully one day assemble together, might give us that answer, but I can say comfortably that the observations that I have seen are as follows. The cases that we have scanned and treated are ones that have trauma of some sort in their life. And I recall recently we were at a venue together, you and I, and someone posed a question that, well, not everyone has trauma. And I believe my answer was, it all depends on your definition of trauma. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And trauma doesn't mean having to break a bone. Trauma can mean a slip on the ice and you bang your head on the ground. Trauma can mean going ahead and going skiing as a child and tumbling. Uh, trauma can mean playing football, uh, anything like that. So, or birth trauma. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Birth trauma is a big one that's not really looked at a lot, and we mm -hmm. see a lot of those cases, actually. So I think in some manner, stress into the cranial cervical junction that constitutes a misalignment of that area, I think is where the possible start of the problem would become or start to come from. Uh, we do know that when the tonsils are low and the misalignment of C1 and C2 is corrected, that we see migration of those tonsils up and up to improve the spinal fluid flow. Actually, yesterday I just finished the, uh, our original study done over three and a half years ago, and the outcomes are very compelling that the cases that we treated, before treatment, the spinal fluid was obstructed, and after the correction, the spinal fluid uh, velocity and flow improved. So, mm -hmm. so we know these things. So I think, it, I think it starts with the misalignment due to a trauma, I think that the tonsils will settle down or can settle down low into the opening in the base of the skull. I think that can constitute an aberrant flow pattern. And I think various factors inside the skull can go ahead and possibly uh, dictate or direct how the manifestation of the disease occurs. We do know from others that there's supposed to be a certain angle of the internal bones in the skull, what's called the clivus bone. And, the and that's cervicosa. what you found with me. Exactly. Exactly. And when those bones are at certain angles, they can manifest maldirecting the spinal fluid yes. or back the uh, spinal fluid in a manner that can be adversely affecting the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen that not only with you, we saw that with your grandson. Yes. And uh, th these are very, very compelling. So we, we have to ultimately in time be able to answer the question of why is it MS and why is it Parkinson's. But these observations and we do have hypothesis of what makes one get Parkinson's and one MS, but again, these are basically our, our hypotheses sure. at the time and observations. But um, so we get the misalignment, we get the low arm tonsils, we get the CSF obstruction, and then when you have that left over time, and time can be variable. We have a patient that came in from Canada with MS that had a roof fall on his head, and six months later was diagnosed with MS. Coincidence? Well, the Canadian government said. It's not a coincidence. It you know has nothing to do with it. Sure. But we think that there was some some correlation to mm -hmm. that. So so I think that um, these observations and they're getting more compelling by the week uh -huh. uh, are continuing to yield the idea that the cranial cervical junction is a very very powerful area. It's powerful in the fact that it's the gateway between the brain and the, the spinal column. It's an area that's very much freely movable, more so than any other segments in the spine. Seventy percent of your head turning comes from the atlas rotating around the C2 vertebra. And we sacrifice stability for range of motion at the cranial cervical junction, which of course is what creates a weakness. And uh, we think that those problems when the right risk factors come in, in terms of how the fluid flows and the angles of the bones, positioning of the tonsils, one being lower on one side than the other. These are all pieces of the puzzle that we think have something to do with uh, the aberrant effects on the brain when those factors are, are in place. Okay, so now uh, let's move on. And uh, one of the other things um, that you have uh, observed is that when you do make the atlas alignment that you get um, a better flow of arterial venous blood flow yes. and you're measuring that now 
And um, so um, part of that is a mechanical compression. Do you want to talk about that? And then we also have the muscle compression. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, the first thing I'll say is that <clears throat> we seem to be discovering things by the month. Something that I never looked for six months ago, I have come across an observation. Now when I go back and retrospectively look at the cases that we scan, we find a preponderance of these things. Sure. And I have to thank you because one of the articles that I had gotten was an article in CCSVI talking about extravascular compression of the venous pathways. Mm -hmm. And the first image that they show in that paper demonstrates the atlas transverse process mechanically compressing the alkaline jugular vein. So when I went back and looked at <clears throat> many of our cohort studies, I found a preponderance of a mechanical compression of the jugular vein by the atlas transverse. Uh, I found them in some cases unilaterally, and in some cases I found it bilaterally. And I actually went through about 40 or 50 of our most complex cases. That would include uh, neurodegenerative brain diseases, patients with concussion, patients with chronic headaches. And I found pretty well all of them had mechanical compression of the jugular vein by the atlas transverse process. And I think that that is a very important finding. I don't think that many are looking at that area in terms of when uh, brain MRIs uh, performed. Mm -hmm. I certainly know Dr. Harshfield, my colleague in uh, musculoskeletal radiologist, until we brought this to his attention, I don't think he was looking at that either. But once he started to see how many of them we were finding, it's something that he obviously is starting to comment on and you know realizes the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Well, if one, it's, it's bad enough to have spinal fluid obstruction, because as we know, spinal fluid is what washes the brain and brings good nutrients into yes. the brain parenchymal cells, and also facilitates, or is supposed to facilitate, removal of metabolic waste and toxins. And as you also would know with CCSVI, when you don't get proper drainage of the venous blood out of the head, then you're gonna start developing venous toxins and they have their own problems as well as you would expect. So when you have compression of the outgoing jugular vein, at the level of the cranial cervical junction, uh, in concordance with the spinal fluid obstruction, we just think that this is plausibly leading to just very poor brain health and might very well be the overall picture of starting to explain why we find, in, certainly in MS cases as well as Parkinson's, there's depositions of not only the tau inflammatory proteins, sure. there's sodium, uh, you know, there's just so many of these, these toxins showing up, and we believe that that might be part of that, uh, the obstruction mechanically by the atlas as well as the spinal fluid obstruction. So I guess my final point is, is that I think that all of us as physicians, when we're going to be evaluating a neurodegenerative brain disease case, I think it's important to do the traditional examination and traditional MRI studies, but I think we all need to start looking at that area to rule in or rule out that there isn't mechanical compression of the jugular vein because if it's something that's missed it could be disadvantageous to the patient Sure. to the extent that they might be receiving wonderful treatment with the intention of trying to help the problem but if that mechanical compression, uh, compression exists if something isn't done to decompress that to improve the outflow of the venous blood I think that the patient might not be able to get the as, as much of a great outcome or further good outcome absolutely. as they could. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, okay, you mentioned about that um, every day that or uh, you just are finding new things all the time. And I was interested a couple of months ago in a phone conversation, and you talked about um, finding about the pituitary gland, something that you had not looked at really before, or it had not you hadn't really recognized it. Do you want to? talk about this because I think it's so uh, relative to some of the MS symptoms um, that people experience. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, by observations, we don't really know something right away. Sometimes I have to look at the image over and over again and just start to look at things that might be different. So we've been getting a lot of not only MS cases, but a lot of concussion cases of late and many or a good portion of these concussion cases, uh, sport injuries, mm -hmm. are describing hormonal issues. And when I started looking, we had one specific case of a, a very um, successful athlete that when I looked at his spinal fluid flow study, I found that the spinal fluid was adversely actually emptying or dumping into the cell of where the pituitary gland is located. 
And when I looked at the pituitary gland, it looked as though it was getting compacted or compressed. And I thought that to be of interest, and what we did was we rendered a treatment, and uh, we did a post-spinal fluid flow study. And on the post-spinal fluid flow study, we went ahead and found that the pituitary gland returned to a normal size. It was very compelling to look at the before and after. So what I did was I went back again and looked at the cohort of cases that we have that described uh, changes in hormonal things or mm -hmm. hormonal types of issues. And when I started looking, I started to realize there were a whole lot more of these aberrant spinal fluid flows into the cella turcica where the pituitary gland was. And then on post I got treatment imaging, we found improvement in those um, in the pituitary gland and their patients reported feeling better. They reported some of the symptoms that had come about from the aberrant flow into the pituitary started to abate and uh, as I mentioned earlier when we discussed this, we have a, a patient that was found to have a large pituitary cyst and um, she was scheduled for a, uh, a brain surgery to remove that mm -hmm. cyst. And subsequently she was uh, flown up here, we did a scan on her, we did a treatment to see if we can help the fluid move better. And to our surprise, after the treatment, the pituitary cyst shrunk in size. And she later returned back to the neurosurgeon who was ready to do the brain surgery. And the neurosurgeon had stated he indeed agreed that the cyst got smaller and said no, uh, no brain surgery at this time, just do a follow-up in about six months. So we seem to have this observation of several cases of but the plausible ability of the spinal fluid to adversely impact the cell turcica where the pituitary gland is, and upon restoring or improving spinal fluid flow, we find that there's uh, pretty much all the cases we've done so far, and we haven't done a thousand, but you know, certainly the ones that we have done, have shown improvement in the pituitary gland and improvement in the hormones, and uh, the case we just spoke of with the pituitary cyst, mm -hmm. within a month of the original correction we did, she had her hormone levels checked and they all returned back to normal in comparison to being abnormal prior to the... One thing, um, two, uh, um, a couple of things. Uh, one is um, you notice the difference on the post and this post scan is done an hour to two hours after the first one and after the adjustment, correct? Correct, yeah. And so uh, people understand that we're not talking that this is these improvements are being seen a month or two months later two months later, it's almost immediate, within 24 hours that you see some of these improvements. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, after doing the discovery of the low-lying tonsils and doing the paper in 2010, I started thinking that, well, I've been treating patients like this, and I wonder what, would, what the imaging would look like if we did a pre-scan, mm -hmm. finding the problem, and then rendered a, a correction, and did a post-scan and see if anything changed. And that started to lead us into doing these pre and post imaging sure. studies. And Which is very important. Well, it uh, certainly was important enough to yeah. pursue. And, and after we did the first few, I would wait about the original cases. We waited a few months to do a post. Oh, okay. But then I said, at a few months, they showed improvement. Then I said, I wonder what it would look like if we did it in four weeks. And in, in four weeks, it showed an improvement. And I said, I wonder what it's like in two weeks. And subsequently, we did it to the point where we did a before and after study within 12 hours and found a difference. And I thought, well, if we are making a correction of the misalignment at the craniocervical junction, and that potentially is contributing to the obstruction of the spinal fluid, I wonder if we made a correction and did a scan within an hour or two of the correction, if it would show a change. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started realizing the change occurs right after the correction. Some of these cases now will do the pre-MRI study we'll go ahead and we'll make a correction, we'll let them rest for half an hour, and then put them right back in the MRI scanner, and we're seeing those changes immediately. So okay. that was a very, very profound observation and something that we do now. So our scan takes about, on, on average, about two hours, and that would include an extensive MRI, including the spinal fluid flow, the arterial venous flow, and so forth. Then we render a correction right on premise at the center where we do the scan, and then we put the patient back in and do a follow-up spinal fluid flow study, can we do that all in a day? Uh, one other thing that, getting back to the pituitary gland, you mentioned um, that um, the blood tests, uh, for hormonal blood tests, that they could be showing actually normal, but you're seeing, is this correct, that you're seeing something different with the pituitary gland? Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, my, the case that we were describing with the pituitary cyst, 
that patient had abnormal hormone blood tests prior to coming up. Okay. So it was abnormal to begin with, and then after we did a correction, she subsequently had a scan uh, uh, blood work done about a month oh, after okay. the treatment, All right. and then a month after the treatment, the hormonal levels improved. We actually have several cases pending now with complaints of hormonal issues mm -hmm. uh, in blood work before treatment, and we're waiting to get follow-ups on them, and if we see a trend, then obviously that will continue to bolster up. Our idea is that that it's plausible that aberrant spinal fluid flow might be a, uh -huh. you know, adversely affecting the pituitary gland. Okay, so uh, let's move on to, um, let's discuss, uh, discuss a little bit about the cord lesions on the spinal cord. Okay. Um, very interesting. I'll have to, again, thank you for a paper that you sent me out of Oxford. Sure. And that paper was done in about 77, so this is prior to the onset of MRIs coming yes. about in the manner that we have them. So the paper describes lesions in the cord due to or at the site of the denticulate ligament attachments, and they're claiming that mechanical stresses put on the cord at the site of the insertion of the dentate ligaments is where they were finding the preponderance of cord lesions. And they showed numerous cadaver studies where they showed that it wasn't as much the draining vein at the site of where the dentate ligament is as much as it was the perivenules. So meaning the small draining veins that drain into the vein at the site of where the dentate ligaments are located is where the lesion load was showing up. So like anything else, I got the paper and I started going back and looking at some cohorts of imaging studies in Son of a Gun. I started finding lesion loads at the site where those dentate ligaments attach. If the imaging is done well, you oftentimes can see the dentate ligaments attachment to the cord. So what they call mechanical stress, um, they say such as a flexion posture, you know, head mm -hmm. down. What we have found in our work, uh, Dr. Grostick uh, had done work back in the 70s and, and came up with a hypothesis of what he calls cord distortion due to mechanical stress by the dentate ligaments. So as mentioned, um, he said that when the atlas misaligns more than three quarters of one degree, that that can start to cause a tension on the cord. And ironically, where the dentate ligaments attach are near two very important spinal nerve bundle tracts. One is called the spinal thalamic tract, which is responsible for sensation of touch and pain and temperature. And the other one is a spinal cerebellar tract, which is responsible for lower limb functions, things like gait and urinary urgency mm -hmm. and so forth. So it started to prompt a question in my mind that, you know, when I ask patients, when I take a history, uh, certainly neurodegenerative brain disease cases, and, you know, uh, difficulties with gait, walking, and so forth is not unique just to MS. People with Parkinson's have altered gaits. People with ALS have altered gaits. Sure. So the question that I had was, is it possible that when you have tension on the cord via the dentate ligaments, could that be somehow playing into this? And, the observations that we're showing, we're seeing something called cord tethering, where we can look at the cord from the top and see instead of the cord being oval, it gets dragged out and gets flattened. It's literally being stretched from end to end. Or as the patient loses the curves in their spine and the spinal canal elongates, mm -hmm. as you elongate the spinal column, the spinal cord is attached to the sacrum, it's attached to the tailbone. So as you elongate the canal, you can start to create a longitudinal stretching of the cord, which we think might have something to do with this as well. So um, we feel that the lesions that show up into the cord, which really aren't looked at and described much by uh, several of the uh, groups that have ideas about what is the genesis of MS, mm -hmm. we think has a lot to do with mechanical stresses via those dentate ligaments. And that's something that we kind of work with all the time. And it's something that's been at the core of the grostic based atlas procedures, which would be atlas orthogonality and other groups like NUCA and orthospinology. Sure. And, and uh, we, uh, sadly, Dr. Grostic died young and never got a chance to know if his hypothesis was correct or not. And I am honored to say, and I've presented at this at numerous uh, presentations, Dr. Grostic was correct. We actually have neuroradiographic imaging showing core distortion and quite dramatic cord distortion, so uh, I'm hmm. proud to say that we were able to help prove that sure. hypothesis. Sure. Okay, um, I think um, we can start closing up here, but I just was, um, this morning, 
we talked about one of your um, case studies, um, an MS patient, and um, that the brain lesions have diminished. Could you just, in summary, tell us just a little bit of history there? Can you sure. share that with us? Sure, sure. Um, the good news was, in this case, this is a, a patient that came in that was diagnosed in January of this so year. So an early diagnosis. Early diagnosis yes. is important for everybody with whatever they manifesting, whether it be uh -huh. neurodegenerative brain disease or any other sure. type of problem. So the history of this patient was he was diagnosed in January. He had an MRI done in January, February, March, and April. Uh, according to his records and according to his history, he continued to deteriorate over that uh, four-month period of time. And that was supported by imaging studies that showed further progression of the lesion load. So he came to us in June of, of this year, <coughs> mid-June, and ironically we found several things of interest with him. We found that he did have aberrant flow into the pituitary gland that showed improvement after the treatment, after mm -hmm. the correction, and uh, he did explain symptoms that were commensurate with the aberrant flow into the pituitary gland before mm -hmm. the treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he also had low-lying cerebellar tonsils quite significantly. He had a severe rotary misalignment of C1 and C2. All the little pieces that we've been noticing with other neurodegenerative brain disease cases. So we treated him in June and then sent him back. He lives in Canada. We sent him back to a colleague of mine who's been training with me, uh, Dr. John Baird. And Dr. Baird has been following up with the patient and making sure that he keeps him in uh, adjustment. Mm -hmm. So within four weeks of seeing the patient, we got a phone call here and my secretary said that he wanted me to go check an email out that he had referred to us or sent to us. And in the email was a radiologist report that described, comparative to the last study he had done in April, that the lesion load had pretty much abated, pretty much completely. And I told my secretary, tell the patient to send me the imaging. I don't necessarily believe something until I see it. I thought quite compelling and I mentioned to you earlier that um, traditionally, we usually do see lesion loads improve within about four to five months. Uh, that's nothing unusual to me. I've been seeing that for many, mm -hmm. many years as a practitioner. But this was the quickest that I've ever seen anything like that. And the lesions weren't small ones. They were quite significant ones. And as I demonstrated oh, yes. to well, you... Yes, I saw them. Yeah. And, uh, yes, they yeah. were. They, yeah. they were not small. Pretty profound. Yes. And, um, uh, nonetheless, he sent the new imaging study, and when I compared the before to after, I was absolutely amazed. Within about four week period of time, those lesions pretty well abated. They sure did. And um, yeah. so now, you know, the question poses: Was it spontaneously remission or spontaneous mm -hmm. remission? Yes. And we've discussed this as would anyone ask that question, and rightfully so. So, um, as we have it from the patient. Within about 10 to 15 minutes post-treatment, the patient reported feeling a positive change. Mm -hmm. And that positive change continued on, certainly uh, since the correction and you know, up to this day. And while one would pose the question, well, could it be spontaneous remission? The answer that I would have or the question that I would have then is that if it's spontaneously remitted, how do you explain that the patient felt better within about a 15 minute of time of treatment? Exactly. Are you trying to say that the spontaneous remission coincided with the 15 minute post treatment? And I don't know that that is biologically plausible. So I can only say that we can only go by the imaging studies. The imaging studies after treatment demonstrated improvement in spinal fluid flow. It demonstrated just an overall better um, environment for brain health. Mm -hmm. And the patient reported within 15 minutes feeling better, and that subsequently has continued on to this day. And another observation, and again, it's just an observation, in this patient's imaging, there looks to be a large lesion that <laughs> looks like a small hole, and uh, that completely abated. And now my questions that I pose to myself is, as we've all been following the concussion venue, and the chronic traumatic encephalopathy which apparently, according to the um, scientists, state that when they do the dissection of these poor injured athletes that might take their lives yes. or die from chronic traumatic encephalopathy, when they look at their brains, they say it kind of looks like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering, we saw a hole somewhat in the brain of this patient we just described that did abate, but I'm almost wondering, is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a long-term sequela of cerebellar tonsillar ectopia and the things that we're observing, and I don't have that answer. 
But if there is a nexus or a connection, the answer again would be to go ahead and, and it's been my passion all along, I think that, I think that contact sport athletes should be screened off season yeah. to try to identify any of these potential risk factors, meaning uh, biomechanical weaknesses, aberrances, aberrant spinal fluid flow, that could possibly in the wrong environment, such as getting a concussion, lead to further or more progressive um, changes that could be becoming part of the long-term sequela that might become sort of a um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. And I bring this topic up because I'm sad to say of late, we're getting a lot of concussion cases and um, we don't accept everybody. Obviously we do a screen to see if we think sure. we can help. Um, some of the cases are of people, and it, it drives me crazy, we get emails by the week now of parents of children ranging from 8, 9, 10 years old up to uh, early 20s. And um, they'll describe about how their child had three, four, five concussions. And I'm questioning why did it go on after the first one. And I, I think there's kind of a disconnect. I think that, and it's no fault of anybody, I mm -hmm. think that this is why we want to publish and get get our observations out there. I think that uh, I just had a case recently of a, of, a, of a chiropractic physician that sent me a email stating that he just treated a young man and had a concussion, the young man was feeling better, and asked me do I think he should return to play because the medical doctors are saying that he's okay and cleared to go back. Mm -hmm. I said I would never send a, uh, a patient back to return to play unless I had at the minimum of an x-ray of the neck to see if there's any of these biomechanical weaknesses sure. or findings that we feel increase their risk for further injury if they were to have mm -hmm. another trauma. So he did take one view of the neck and then I looked at it and there were two areas of suspicion. And I, I called him back and I said, you really need to go ahead and do a flexion x-ray, an x-ray with the head and neck bent forward. I said, because that will rule in or rule out if that area is stable or not. When that patient went into flexion, and I think he's a young teenager, when that patient went into flexion, there were four levels of listesis, meaning four cervical segments moved further forward on top of each other, kind of stacked. Okay. In a manner that proved to me that there is no way in heck uh -huh. that that patient should return to play no matter what anybody thinks. That uh -huh. is a biomechanical weakness, and that's what we're finding with many of these you know, repetitive concussion sure. cases. We're finding the spine after the first concussion might yield an injury, and that they're looking at the concussion portion and they're not looking at the craniocervical junction or the cervical spine. Uh. And I don't think you can hit the head without in some manner plausibly influencing the craniocervical junction in the neck. So I think that they need to continue to do the concussion evaluation as they do and they do a great job of that. But I think that without, in, without bringing in an assessment of the craniocervical junction in the neck, I don't know that they're getting the complete picture as they probably could or should. And I think if they had a better assessment of the craniocervical junction in the neck, we'd see a lot less players returning back possibly too early or too sure. quickly. Okay. And we probably can make the game safer by finding ones that had an injury that should never be able to go back again. Mm -hmm. You know, we have several high profile players that were, had one concussion and should have never went back to doing their sport ever okay. again, yeah. but were encouraged to do so because of yeah. you know, necessity. So. Okay, um, lastly, um, you briefly mentioned there about publishing, and um, that's one thing um, I think since um, our introduction I've been saying, okay, when are you going to publish, when are you going to publish, Cause, uh, and um, you've been very um, oh, dedicated to making sure that your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted, which has been, um, um, I do have to say that that's important. So um, could you let us know, Do you, can you share with us a little bit about when you are looking towards publishing your first paper? Sure. Let me say that um, the reason of the cautiousness, I'm thankful that, um, again, I have a, a great team of colleagues that are part of our project sure. of research. Uh -huh. And one of them is a dear friend and mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Freeman. And thankfully, Dr. Freeman is a forensic trauma epidemiologist. And if you want to know about things that happen in a portion of the public, you go when you have an epidemiologist involved in your work, because the epidemiologist is the one that keeps you grounded 
you know, it's one thing to say I observe something, but it's another thing to say is that observation, you know, a rare bird, or is it something mm -hmm. that really makes sense? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Freeman has continually kept me in check to make me understand that until we have enough data collected that the observation means something. You know, anything more than using the term observation is speculative. You know. And sadly, I've had too many patients, as you might have heard from other venues that had been told, you got this, you got that, and we're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you're going to be perfect, and it's not necessarily the outcome. So what I hate most is I hate to see someone suffer, but I also don't want to promise someone something that I don't know we can mm -hmm. give them. Give false hope. Exactly. Because what I have found is usually by the time they get to us or other people that are doing you know complex cases like us, by the time they get to us, we might very well be their last hope. Mm -hmm. And if you don't provide them what they had hoped for, the, the discomfort, the disappointment, the depression that can come about of you being that last final hope and not being able to give them what they had hoped or prayed for, uh, can put them into a, a worse condition than the pathophysiological condition that they already have is. Sure. So, uh, so let me clearly state that the reason that we've been doing this very quietly behind the scenes, so to speak, mm -hmm. is that we want to make sure that the observations are are real. We want to make sure that they're consistent. We want to collect data to see that what we are thinking does make sense or not. And that's where we are pulling in other people to help. So um, with that end, uh, I just completed yesterday our original study that we discussed in the early part yes. of the interview. Uh, I completed that and that's been sent off to Dr. Freeman for him to evaluate the data. And if the numbers and everything fare as well as I have Assessment they look to me, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then we'll start to go ahead and put a paper together that we hope will be done by the end of this year and plausibly be able to be published early next year. And then, of course, uh, as we also discussed earlier, when we did that original cohort and we recognized that there were some neurodegenerative brain disease cases involved in that cohort, um, what we also did, as you know, which is when you came up to visit mm -hmm. us, was that I said, well, maybe we need to look at neurodegenerative brain disease cases separately as an entity, and that's where we did many studies of MS and Parkinson's and dementia and so sure. forth. So we're sitting on a ton of great uh, data. We just have to do the launching of the original observation and then uh, see what that observation has yielded. We think we have a good idea of that. And then once we have completed that, then we'll go into kind of a more quicker mode at getting to the further observations made with just looking at the neurodegenerative brain disease cases and uh, continuing to get involved with more people that can help us further uh, understand what we believe is going on and is it plausible and if so, mm -hmm. how do we get this information out, um, which obviously publishing is one of the best sure. ways. We want to we wanna go ahead, we all know that there is no one discipline or physician that has all the answers to the problem. We know we're all parts of a puzzle. And what we're hoping for is that the pieces that we've observed through the neuroradiographic imaging that we do, we're hoping that we'll be able to at some point in the very near future present these pieces to the medical community, the scientific community, and sure. say, hey, we came across this stuff and we got pictures of it and it's kind of interesting to look at the picture and maybe this is pieces of the puzzle that you had not looked at before or might not have understood how it could correlate. And again, I will say with great thanks <clears throat> if it wasn't for Dr. Demadian and Fonar and all my dear friends that have at Fonar that have helped me dream, make dreams come true mm -hmm. in terms of requesting things, we just we we've been doing imaging thick slices about 2.8 millimeters, which is kind of what I thought was the limit of the ability of the scanner to do. Well, thanks to Fonar and their engineers, they just came back to me and said, "You can do it now at two millimeters." And now we just started experimenting with some new sequences that they provided to me and we're seeing it at two millimeters with clarity and detail that I never dreamed possible ten years ago. So, um, so again, the hopes are, and again, thanks to them for helping uh, with the technology, because as Dr. Debatian put it in our, many of our conversations, when he went to med school, and uh, figure 1960-61, he, he always tells me the story that he was asked by one of his professors to go do a spinal tap. And in those days, he had thought that spinal fluid was nothing more than a stagnant, fluid that kept buoyancy to the brain to keep the brain floating. Mm -hmm. He had no idea of the dynamics of it. And without that spinal fluid flow software, we could have never dreamed to be able to observe what we're, what we're seeing now. And we do have imaging showing aberrant flow patterns. We have imaging showing 
fabric flow patterns eroding the internal bone of the skull. Yes, you do. And we also yes, have, I've yeah, seen those. yeah. And we're thinking if it can erode the bone in the skull, it can't be too healthy if the aberrant fluid patterns hit or impact the brain or brainstem. And of course, we now have imaging over many years demonstrating the aberrant flow impacting the brainstem and the brain. And when we look at the static imaging of where the fluid was hitting that tissue, we see lesions. Yes. So now the question is, is lesions due to solely autoimmune, or is there a, a mechanical component? Is there aberrant hydrodynamics? And we think it's a combination of sure. all of the above. And back to the original statement, cancer is cancer. Just a matter of where it manifests in the body, maybe what we're looking at is a similarity of neurodegenerative brain disease is just a dissimilar manner in which they present. What they present, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, Dr. Rosa, thank you so much. I certainly appreciate you spending the time um, this afternoon and uh, really appreciate all the work that you are doing um, for the patients with neurodegenerative brain disease. And look forward to seeing the paper published and uh, your continuing research. Every time I talk with you, you've got new observations that I'm just amazed with. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. and. Um, I'd also like to add at the end that um, there are, because of the fact that there are so many people that are suffering, um, we're trying to do everything we can as efficiently and quickly as possible. Uh, I don't want it to be thought that I'm trying to preclude people from having access to something that can help them. Sure. We just, we've learned from others. We don't want to give something out that we don't know fully and fully understand at the moment. So I'll leave you with this. My, one of my dearest colleagues involved in our uh, project is an uh, emergency room physician over 50 years, Dr. Jack Carlton. And Dr. Carlton has been with me all along, and Dr. Carlton had once said when I explained about how, you know, there, there's a lot of people that have been supportive of the observations and work, and there have been some that are not necessarily so supportive in making thoughts that, you know, we're somehow trying to restrict the world and sure. not want to help everybody as quickly as yeah. possible as mentioned. And Dr. Carlton made a very good point. He said, the gentleman, the physician that invented the heart transplant from South Africa, mm -hmm. from the day of the incision of him creating that, that method, uh, to the time it became available mainstream was 30 years. Now, I'm not saying it's going to take us 30 years to do what we're doing, but what it is is that that was good science. Obviously, to go ahead and put a heart or you know, take a heart out of someone and put a new one in is a very complex thing. And he wanted to make darn sure that the people, not only that what he was doing was effective, but that the physicians he was going to train on any given day can do the procedure with accuracy and detail. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we're at uh, in this concept with the IGAD. I'm starting to train some Atlas doctors. Uh, again, I don't preclude any Atlas doctor from treating anything, but we, we request that they don't use our name and say that they do what I do. Uh, to the extent that we are using the MRI to guide that. So our hopes are is to continue the research, you know, monitor the observations, publish the, the data, and then train the doctors uh, sufficiently to be able to do this in a manner that we keep the successes as good as possible uh, and make sure that we're doing what we believe we should be doing in a safe and, and proper manner. So I appreciate it. Okay, your well, absolutely. Well, thank you again.